Thanks, Molly. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to Outcome Measurement Using ACRL's Project Outcome for Academic Libraries. Like Molly mentioned, my name is Jennifer Arnold, and I'm here with my colleague, Sara, this afternoon. Um, we're glad that you could be here with us today to learn a little bit more about this project. Sorry about that. Um, our presentation today will provide you with background information on the Public Library Association's project outcome, which served as the genesis for the ACRL project. We'll talk about the past, current, and upcoming work of the ACRL project outcome for Academic Libraries Task Force, the survey field testing and analysis, and present a case study that describes how the Central Piedmont Community College Library has employed the surveys to make evidence-informed decisions about our services. And with that, um, Sara will get us started with the PLA project outcome background. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so I am program manager and project lead on the ACRL's project outcome for academic libraries. Um, and normally one of my colleagues from the Public Library Association would give this part of the presentation, um, but I will do my best. So the genesis for this project, as Jennifer said, um, is a toolkit called Project Outcome. And for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a free online toolkit designed to help public libraries understand and share the impact of their programs and services by providing simple surveys and an easy to use process for measuring and analyzing outcomes. Um, it also provides libraries with resources and support to apply their results um, and advocate for their future. Um, and it's been in the public library field since 2015. At the moment, there are over 200,000 patron surveys um, collected in the system and over 1,300 participating um, libraries. And overall, the toolkit gives you um, seven basic surveys, um, an easy to use survey management tool that allows you to collect um, collect and enter survey data. Um, you can create custom data reports and interactive data dashboards for analyzing results. And then there's a host of resources um, and training materials to help libraries through the outcome measurement process. Um, public library users um, have found that this combination of ready to use surveys and easy tools um, really help staff save time and integrate um, assessment and outcome measurement into their work. And it leaves more time for decision making and advocacy once you have those results. Um, next slide, please, Jennifer. Um, so overall, the basis for this is outcome measurement. And outcomes really answer the question, um, what good did we do? Or in other words, how are library users or patrons changed as a result of our efforts? And what is the impact of our work? Um, so the outcome measurement questions um, look at changes, effects, and impacts on a range of things, including knowledge, skills, attitudes, opinions, behaviors, actions, and status. Um, next slide, please. So each of the project outcome surveys uses four quantitative questions and two qualitative questions. And the four quantitative questions align with four outcomes, knowledge, confidence, application, and awareness. And the two qualitative questions then ask what a patron liked the most and what the library can do to improve. And this model we're carrying over from the public library um, version of the site into ACRL's adapted project outcome toolkit. And I do want to highlight that um, we talk a lot about the quantitative data, but the qualitative data is actually really important as well. Um, and libraries have used, public libraries have used those questions um, to gain insight into how their patrons um, are using their services and what more they want. That's one of the things that comes up the most is um, seeing that patrons want more similar programs or services. Okay, uh, next slide. So overall, the project outcome approach um, is key in a few ways. It prioritizes a ground up approach. So this is something that libraries of any size, um, any sort of staffing level can use the tool. You can use it basically straight out of the box. Um, it is organized around convenient sampling. You can use it to do more research oriented sampling, but you don't have to. Um, there is a heavy reliance on field level engagement and feedback, so it's something that we continue to work on and improve over time, um, as ACRL is doing with uh, the task force that Jennifer is a part of. Um, peer examples and case studies have been really key um, in terms of outreach and this presentation also I think being an example of how we're going to start doing that for ACRL. Um, there are a lot of partnerships between users and the association to improve the tool. 
And there's an iterative learning process um, that creates opportunities for new content and approaches to design. And another example of that is PLA is going to be launching another survey um, that they're adding to the toolkit around health. So there are seven surveys already um, and they've partnered to create a new one. Um, so PLA noticed that academic library users were registering for their toolkit, um, but the survey topics in the public library side aren't relevant to them. There are things like um, early childhood literacy and, um, and similar summer reading, things that aren't academic libraries aren't going to use, um, but it suggested a level of interest in this model among academic libraries. And so PLA approached ACRL with that information and suggested creating the adaptation that we are talking about today. Um, so Jennifer and I are gonna switch off a little bit and throughout the presentation and I will hand it back over to her for the next section. Okay, so um, while outcome assessment uh, may be common in higher education already, the project outcome model will offer practitioners without the requisite training or resources an alternative, particularly when, that, when the alternative in the past has really not been doing assessment at all. Um, so the goal of, um, sorry, that's flipping too fast. Um, the goal of this project is to provide free access to a standardized set of measures in, in an easy to use toolkit that can be used by academic libraries of any size that easily measures the learning outcomes of their program and services via seven user focused surveys and provides the means and guidance to use the data as improvements for um, basis for improvements and for advocacy as Sara mentioned. Um, what you see now is the slide that the, the shows the charge the task force received from the ACRL board in November of 2017. Currently, the benchmarks are only at a national level and based on um, basic Carnegie classifications, but state benchmarking may be added later, um, funding permitted. Um, the theory of change that you see here was adapted from the PLA model and developed at the first ACRL task force meeting. As you can see, it builds from the adoption of project outcome measures to outcome measurement being a common practice, where libraries can use the measures to capture value, communicate that value to patrons, funders, and peers, bolster advocacy efforts with data, do some benchmarking, and engage in continuous improvement. This slide shows you the timeline for the project, and as you can see, it's an aggressive year-long timeline, and where we currently are at is that Questions for the immediate surveys have been finalized, and the task force is in the process of revising questions for follow-up surveys and developing the online resources that will go with the toolkit that will help direct people on how um, they can best make use of the resources that are there. We expect that users will be able to register for the toolkit and see some of the resources in the next three to four weeks. And the full launch of the survey management tool and dashboards are on schedule for the ACRL conference in April. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, before we finish up the presentation today. Instruction, events and programs, research, teaching support, digital and special collections, space and library technology are the seven survey topics and areas that the task force decided on. Um, as Sara mentioned, the public library model originally had seven surveys, but again, those topics like summer reading um, really weren't applicable in the academic environment. So we sort of started from their model and worked um, through task force meetings to identify these seven areas as really applicable broadly across um, the academic library environment. And I will turn it back over to Sara to talk about the field testing results and analysis from the field testing of the surveys. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so to arrive at that list of survey areas, um, the task force actually started with a slightly modified um, list of topics. And it's through a process of field testing um, that we arrived at those seven. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. 
Um, so between June and October of last year, um, we asked for volunteers to field test um, the surveys that the task force had developed. And in that time, we got 108 volunteers from 100 institutions um, across the nation. This map shows a geographical distribution of all the volunteers and then with the bubble sized by response count and colored by Carnegie class. Um, and at the end of this section, I'll put in a link for you to be able to explore this in more detail. Um, by the end of the field testing process, 54 institutions had submitted a total of 11,449 survey responses, which I think vastly exceeded anything we expected, um, but we were delighted. And the responses were well distributed between types of institutions. So with community colleges contributing 27% of the total, baccalaureate granting institutions also contributing 27%, uh, master's granting institutions 21%, doctorate granting institutions 24%, um, and special focus the remaining 1%. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this just shows you the um, pie chart in a little bit more detail. This, these are the volunteers um, by institution type in terms of volunteers versus um, responses. The breakdown was slightly different, but pretty close and um, still well distributed among the different types of institutions. Um, next slide. So these were the seven original um, names of the surveys. You can tell that they've been modified slightly um, in the field testing process. Um, we saw that undergraduate instruction was by far the most popular. It had over 9,000 um, of the total responses and the largest number of institutions using that particular survey. Um, we also saw the space survey um, being very popular as well. And that one had been challenging to develop, I think, for the task force because it's difficult to figure out how to measure the learning outcomes of the space versus something like satisfaction with the space. Um, not all the surveys experience such high levels of engagement. Um, the teaching support one is probably less because there are fewer programs or services offered in that area and they engage fewer users. Um, just there being generally fewer teaching faculty and graduate students than undergraduates overall. Um, the digital collection survey did not get much take up at all, um, possibly because the topic wasn't as widely relevant. Um, and so for the final toolkit, the task force has changed that survey um, from digital collections to digital and special collections to hopefully give it a broader applicability. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is overall what the responses look like across the seven surveys. Um, and again, I'll put a link in that lets you explore that in more detail. Um, so this is a divergent stacked bar chart which shows the response scores for each survey. Um, those in purple to the right of the axis are positive. They're the agree or strongly agree answers um, on the quantitative questions. Um, the gray in the middle is neutral and then the green on the left are the negative disagree or strongly disagree. Um, the average scores, which are in the gray circles on the right and probably impossible to read just in this um, screen grab, um, definitely skew towards the positive. They're all around four. Um, and again, if you're interested in exploring these in detail, the link I'll share um, has a, a link to the interactive um, data visualization. So you can look at those in detail. You can also break down the results um, by Carnegie class and by survey. Okay, um, so Jennifer, back over to you. Okay, um, so as Sarah mentioned, I was one of the task force, method, um, task force members, and um, my college participated in uh, the field testing process. Um, so I'd like to talk um, a little bit about the ways in which um, we've already adopted um, the project outcomes um, model here at Central Piedmont. I'll talk a little bit about where we are with the assessment when the project came along, just so you have a little bit of a feel for how this, um, why we were attracted to this particular project and what we hope it can do for us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've already made some decisions just based on the feedback that we got as part of the field testing process that I think really increased the value of library services for our patrons based on that survey data and feedback. So um, assessment at, at CTCC is a little bit all over the place and sort of has been. Um, the college, of course, has an institutional effectiveness department that's focused on you know, the big picture assessment at the college, but it's primarily done through a lens of accreditation, right? Both for the college 
um, through SACS is for individual program accreditations like our paralegal program or our nursing program. We've worked with them at various times to develop surveys that would help with assessment of library resources or services or programs, um, but they're a relatively small department. Um, they're actually in the midst of an organizational overhaul. Um, they um, and had some turnover that has uh, created that, um, that sort of necessity to, to reorganize their department. So it hasn't been always possible to get their assistance when we need it. Um, they're really great people, but they're busy, and I'm sure that's probably a, a common um, feature of institutional effectiveness departments. Um, so, and they have a lot of constituencies on campus that um, require their time and attention. So we were really excited about this project because it gave us an opportunity um, to do this type of assessment um, ourselves. Um, within the library itself, um, assessment has always been sort of ad hoc. Um, we are a large community college, but probably relatively light staffed compared to other academic institutions of a similar size. So we've never had an assessment librarian or anyone on staff who has really sort of formal training or experience in assessment practices or in working with data um, at a more sophisticated level um, than sort of looking at survey results. Um, we have recently formed a new assessment committee. Um, some of that has actually come out of our involvement in this particular project, and that is who worked together to deploy um, the surveys that we did field test. Um, and we know that we need to work towards having an assessment position. Um, it's not a reality yet, but I think some of the work that we're doing here with these surveys is really going to demonstrate the value um, of this project and of doing this kind of outcome assessment within the library to our um, larger college community. So at CP, we um, did field test the surveys. We field tested um, survey two related to events and programs, survey six um, related to space, and survey seven on library technology. So the event that we assessed was a fake news program that was held in conjunction with our Student Life Department's Constitution Day programming. Um, and we distributed paper surveys at the end of that program and ended up with uh, 24 responses from students in attendance. Um, the, student, the survey results gave us valuable, a valuable peek at what the students took away from the program that I think will help us improve that presentation for the future. Um, like Sara mentioned, those um, qualitative comments at the end of the survey were really enlightening um, in terms of what pieces of information in that program really hit home for the students and what they would want to see and sort of future programming that they would be willing to come to and attend. The space survey um, we used to assess our group study rooms, um, and the technology survey was used to, uh, with our circulating laptop program. Um, we did use paper surveys in all of these instances because um, as a part of this process, in the, the, what we were um, attempting to assess, it just made sense to hand the students a paper copy of the survey in this case. But in the future, we'll work more with our institutional effectiveness department to sort of deliver these surveys electronically. So both options are very workable um, within our context. Um, the surveys were very easy to administer. And after collection, because we did distribute the, the surveys on paper, um, we had one of our part-time staff members um, enter the data um, after those surveys were complete. Um, one lesson that we did learn was that timing is really important. So when we delivered the surveys in the course of a semester, particularly for the space survey was really important. Um, so we were in with the technology survey. I think um, one of the things we'll work towards in the future is understanding when we're going to get the best um, results and when students are really um, able to provide um, the type of feedback and response um, that we want from those surveys. So even in just, like I mentioned, even in just the field testing phase, these surveys have been really valuable in helping us develop improvements to our services. So from the technology survey, um, we were really prompted to think about what software is loaded on those computers um, for students and how to make it easily accessible for them. 
So if you can see on the screen, one of the comments um, that we got in that survey was about um, the way that Adobe functioned on their circulating laptop and the fact that it sort of wasn't automatically um, loading for students. And the person who um, is our technology support person here in the library studied the results of the survey and he realized that that was something that he could pretty easily fix that would satisfy a student need that would make it, students wouldn't be coming up to the desk with questions about Adobe. It would automatically be available for them. So it would improve the service for the students, but it would also reduce um, the time that staff have to, to mediate um, what the students are doing on the laptop. Um, so it's a real practical improvement that benefits students as well as makes the, um, the laptops easier to manage from a staff perspective. That same survey also prompted us to think about what kind of tutorials we could develop that would assist novice students in using the technology available via the library. You know, someone asked about tutorials in Lunch and Learns. Um, a lot of community college students are novice technology users and um, getting the laptop up and running, getting it connected to the college Wi-Fi, these are all often activities where it takes a little bit of explanation and working with the student to get them set up. So um, what the survey let us know is that um, if we were more proactive about that kind of activity, then we could probably really um, improve um, the way that students um, assess that particular serv uh, service. Like Sarah mentioned, the, the, the um, qualitative results that we got were all very high. You know, students were really um, pleased with the service. They liked being able to check out a laptop and take it to class if they didn't have access to one or they happened to forget theirs that day. Um, but what the survey, the real um, interesting parts of the survey were really in these types of things that directed us towards practical improvements that we could continue to make in order to serve our students better. Um, so we are um, also got some good comments um, that will help us change um, group study room policies. Um, those came out of the space survey that we did. Um, so we are currently um, in the process of building a new library. And so that group study room survey really pointed us to some sort of amenities, for lack of a better word, um, and technology that students um, want in those rooms, as well as how they're sort of using those existing rooms right now that are really going to help us design new spaces that meet their needs. So we're already taking the data that we got from how students are using library spaces and using it to design new spaces that are going to be far better in addressing um, how students use the space and what they want to see in that space um, as they move forward in their college careers. Um, we also believe that um, these benchmarking, benchmarking um, ability of this project um, will be a key feature that will help us advocate for resources in the future. Um, we are currently in the process of advocating um, for larger numbers of group study rooms and the satisfaction that students have with these services, the amount of, that they're using these services are all elements of sort of an advocacy program that we can take and say, this, this, we have hard data that shows how students are using this, how much they like it, um, and here's the things that they're saying that they want in these spaces. So that kind of advocacy um, can be really powerful um, for all types of libraries, but particularly for us at the community college. And we also believe we're gonna be able to track trends over a time um, in a way that we really haven't been able to before because we'll kind of have this consistent data as we can do these surveys you know, every year, every semester, however we work out that timing, we'll be able to track trends, we'll be able to look at other community colleges and understand what they're doing, um, we'll be able to look nationally at what results are to kind of judge um, where we are and how we're performing in relation to our peers that are out there. So, um, again, just from the field testing portion, we here at CP are really excited about um, what the data that we'll be able to get out of the project outcome surveys, and then what we'll be able to turn around and do um, with that data. So um, here is a look at what's next, and I'll let Sarah talk about what will be happening at the ACRL conference in April. 
Okay, um, so for the final toolkit, once it, it launches, you will get to add up to three open-ended questions per survey. And this is something um, we saw people looking for in the field testing. It wasn't part of the field testing process, um, but you will be able to do that once Project Outcome for Academic Libraries is live. Um, also real-time results um, using interactive data dashboards that allow you to um, create all sorts of different charts. You can create custom reports, again, that you can use to help advocate for resources as Jennifer was talking about, um, and explore resources and an online community of Project Outcome users to learn about more effectively measuring um, outcomes in your library. So the official launch of Project Outcome for Academic Libraries is scheduled for the ACRL conference in Cleveland in April. And during the day on Friday at the conference, we will be offering a series of five hour long workshops that are just open. You can come and learn about the new tool. Um, and members of the task force will be there as well um, to talk about it and, and help. Um, Hopefully, prior to that, in just a few weeks, we'll actually be launching the uh, the tools for registration. So this will allow you to register and to see some of the resources. And then as soon as the full toolkit goes live in April, you would get immediate access to that. So watch this space. There will be um, announcements coming from ACRL. I can uh, promise that. Um, so I think we are happy to take questions. Jennifer, it looks like there's one in the chat box that is directed at you, if you... Okay. Yeah. Molly, can you... I cannot see the chat box when I am sharing. Sure, I can read you the question. It's, okay. did you have to get your surveys approved by any kind of institutional review board at your college? Um, we did not um, have to do that. Um, we're at, we do, we don't have um, an IRB like you would have at a university. Our institutional effectiveness department um, is typically the one who sends out electronic surveys um, to students. So we made them aware of what we were doing and they were fine with the project, but we have a sort of um, probably less formal approach um, than you might see at a four-year institution with a formal IRB process. So institutional effectiveness was aware because the surveys were being given to students. But because they weren't being distributed via email at this point, the um, approval was a little more informal. I'll also add to that that the surveys are anonymous. They're, it doesn't ask for any name or identifying information. Any other questions? Okay, another question. Um, will it be possible to compare local results to some peer institutions as is possible within LibQual? Um, you cannot compare your results to a specific institution, but you will be able to benchmark your results against others in your Carnegie class and nationally. Um, and then as Jennifer mentioned, um, it's possible we may add state level benchmarking down the road. It seemed like Carnegie class would be more useful um, starting off. Anyone else? Jennifer, could you put up the last slide? Just if you do have any questions um, specific to project outcome, you're more than welcome to contact me and I'm sure Jennifer would be happy to talk about um, her library's experiences as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> 